Our gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful to you because you are our Creator God, the one who created in the beginning, who is the first and the last, the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. And today as we look at the implications of looking at creation through a hermeneutical lens and the implications as a test case for hermeneutics, I pray that you would be with us in this room. Bless each person that is here and those that will be listening or are listening. And we ask, Lord, for your presence. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You will remember that in April through June 2020, we studied this quarterly on how to interpret scripture that I was asked to write with my cousin, Dr. Frank Hosel, who is a systematic theologian and works at the Biblical Research Institute at the General Conference. We divided up the chapters or the Sabbaths, the weeks, and uh, I wrote seven chapters, he wrote six, and uh, it was a wonderful, wonderful thing to write something together like this. We had not done that before, and, um, and it was a great experience to do that. And I was asked for this conference to speak about hermeneutics, which is the technical term, which means the field of study concerned with how we interpret the Bible or other literary texts. Yesterday, we talked about the authority of Scripture. And I obviously cannot condense uh, three uh, months worth of study that many of you went through into just two presentations. What I'm going to do today is I'm going to expand on two of the chapters or two of the weeks, thank you, sir, and um, go even further into depth uh, and look at creation as a test case for biblical hermeneutics. And uh, just to let you know, this is actually a chapter out of one of these three books, The last one that you see here on the right-hand side that just came out in 2020. Uh, I have two chapters in there, one on history and the Bible, which is quite fascinating. I'm an archaeologist, a scientist, and so that was uh, definitely uh, in my area of, of thinking for many years now. And then I also wrote an article, chapter 11, one of the last chapters on the Genesis account as a test case for biblical hermeneutics. And I chose creation because everything hinges on creation. In scripture, everything, that is the foundation. That's the beginning, right? Bereshit is the Hebrew term for Genesis, which means in the beginning. It's the first word of the Bible. In the beginning. So uh, this obviously has been a major focus an area of interest for the Seventh-day Adventist Church for many, many years. As you know, as you may know, creationism, creation science, has been a focal point of the Seventh-day Adventist Church for many years. In fact, we have been credited as being most influential in the development of creation science, if you will with George McCready Price and others who have been involved in, in, in that. We have a Geoscience Research Institute that used to be located at Andrews University, now is at Loma Linda University. We have Geoscience Institute satellite uh, institutes in different divisions of the world field. We are very interested in this area and in this topic. When I was a young professor here, I had only been teaching here a couple of years, I was invited to be part of probably the most expensive and longest intense study and debate in the church, a conference entitled the Faith and Science Conferences, 2002 to 2004. And I remember some of my old friends, lay people in the church, asking me, why are we spending so much time, so many years, so much money, bringing scholars and theologians together from all over the world field to discuss the issue of origins? Don't we have that figured out yet? And the answer is, we should, but it has been a major, major area of contention in the world, in our church. 
And I saw, I was witness in those meetings to a, um, let's just say a debate, a series of presentations as, at various of those meetings uh, where no one held back any punches, to use a colloquial term or phrase. In other words, there were people there in the church that were espousing for every area under the spectrum of origins. And they were openly invited to give their perspectives. The results of those meetings were both encouraging and discouraging. One result that was discouraging was that the professors that espoused views that were not in harmony with the official teachings of the church, well, life continued as if nothing had happened after 2004. And thousands of students at our universities were impacted and continue to be impacted today. An encouraging thing that happened was that there was a resolution that came out of that, strongly supported by the General Conference and the Biblical Research Institute and the Geoscience Research Institute that solidified, and there was a document produced that eventually with time, over an extended period of time, and a lot of bureaucracy, and some of you have been involved in church politics know this is quite an ordeal, it led eventually to a reformulation of our doctrine number six on creation which was much more specified and much more, uh, let's just say, accurate in terms of what the church really believes um, in the language that was used. To the rejoicing of some and to the great consternation of others. Some of you may have been uh, in tune with uh, the recent general conference session that just took place a few weeks ago. And you may have heard that uh, Two statements were eventually voted by the General Conference there, one on the authority of the Bible and one on the authority of Ellen White. But it was not an easy situation. You'd think those would be easy situations to vote on as a world church. But the statement on the Bible was sent back to committee by the voting body and almost would not have seen the light of day again, most likely, at least at this general conference session if the Holy Spirit hadn't been working in my humble estimation. The major contention was the term literal when placed with the creation week by several divisions of the world church or delegates from those divisions. I won't go off naming them. If you have any inkling, let's just say they were not part of the developing world. <laughs> the General Conference has, uh, and the Biblical Research Institute and the Geoscience Research Institute has produced a number of books. This is uh, one of the more recent books published in 2015. Um, I, my father and I was asked to re-edit and rewrite an article that my father wrote many years ago as the lead article in the book. Um, dealing with the creation account. This is the Old Testament volume and the New Testament volume is coming out this year. And it will also have uh, a chapter there um, that is similar to what I'm going to present today. This chapter is in this book. And by the way, you can order these books from the Biblical Research Institute. Uh, this is fantastic. This volume here, we have an international group of scholars that are uh, talking about all kinds of subjects from um, the transmission of the text and versions of the Bible to uh, most, the most recent trends in hermeneutics and how Adventists should relate to those and uh, presuppositions and authority of scripture. Uh, there are both scientists as well as theologians that are writing for this volume and it's, it's an interesting and, and good, good resource, I think, that you will be interested in. There's also videos that have been made of, out of each chapter and you can go onto the BRI website at the General Conference and get those videos. I wasn't surprised when I was at the Faith and Science Conferences in 2002 to 2004. 
because I grew up in a home where these issues were something that my father dealt with on a regular basis. As dean of the seminary at Andrews University, as part of the Faith and Science Commission, as it was called back then, um, he was involved in these discussions for a very long time. We used to go on field trips, geoscience research field trips all over the United States. Two months out of the summer, we'd put the camper on the back of our Oldsmobile Toronado and we would go in caravan style through all the national parks in North America with general conference vice presidents, with uh, theologians, with scientists. I remember Ariel Roth at at uh, uh, former director of the institute, the Geoscience Research Institute, and I was a young boy, you have to forgive me, but Ariel Roth had a lot of head hair on this part of his head, and not a lot of hair here. And there was a lightning storm, there was an electric storm in Arizona, and I remember we were standing on a mesa. I remember two things, you, you remember these things as a young boy, eight years old, you know. I remember touching and reaching out for the handle of the car, and before I reached it about three inches, there was an arc of electricity that reached my hand. Um, that's how charged the atmosphere was. And then I remember Professor Roth um, lecturing, and his hair literally was standing out like this. <laughs> and I thought to myself, you know what? That looks very close, and those of you who are older might remember this Bozo the Clown thing. <laughs> that I grew up with when I was that age, and I was like, oh my goodness. But I had a tremendous, tremendous respect for Professor Roth, and I grew up doing that. I remember the first time when I was about seven, my dad told me. I remember exactly where I was. You know, there's things that happen as in your childhood that you don't remember, and there's things that happen that you remember as if it was yesterday. And you'd think, why is this so important? But I remember the day my dad told me we were standing inside the garage of our house, right behind that Oldsmobile Toronado, that 72 Oldsmobile Toronado. And I remember my dad telling me, you know, Michael, the reason I'm going on this meeting, to this meeting this weekend, and I won't be home with you guys, is because um, I want to defend the biblical account of creation. Amen. And I said to my dad, I says, why? What's the big deal? And he told me for the first time, well, it's because some people don't believe in that and um, there's good biblical evidence for it. I was floored. How could anybody question creation? <laughs> anyway, I hope some of us are still floored today. So let's uh, look at the next uh, slide. This is my outline for today, and I've taken up too much time in introductions, so I'm gonna have to move rather quickly to get through all of this. This is gonna be fairly intense. I'm glad it's recorded. You can look at this later on. And you can look at it. We're going to be talking about biblical authority unity. We're going to be talking about the implications and what it means to accept a literal view of creation, what the Bible teaches about a literal view of creation, and what, it teach, what, it, what others have tried to do to Scripture to fit it into a different mold that would make life more acceptable for them in the world that we live in today. And we're going to look at the impact of Genesis on biblical authority, unity, and inspiration. We're going to look at the impact of Genesis on the question of the character of God and moral accountability. We're going to look at the question of creation and the nature of Adam and Eve. We're going, and I shouldn't have put those in quotes, but some people would. We're going to look at what it means, this is obvious I think for most Adventists, but what it means for the Sabbath. Often that's what we only think of when we think about creation and its implications. But the reality is that every single one of our doctrines are impacted. This is just a sampling of those, okay? Finally, we're going to look at marriage and the family. Oh, there was a whole chapter in my Sabbath school quarterly book on that. That's a very touchy subject nowadays, isn't it? We're going to look at origin, the origin of sin and the plan of redemption. And finally, we're going to look at the old and new creation. So to put on your seatbelts. The creation account in Genesis 1 through 2 is foundational for all of these things. But let's start with that first verse in Genesis. In the beginning, 
God created the heavens and the earth. Now, I have the privilege of teaching Hebrew here on our campus. I've been teaching that now for 25 years, and every year I begin with my students. They don't even know Hebrew yet, but in the third, second week of Hebrew, when they're still learning the alphabet, we start with Genesis chapter 1. And it's kind of an inductive way of getting them into the text. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now we know this, we've memorized it, we know this passage really well, but are you really, when you read this passage, are you really understanding the depth of this simple yet profound statement? Because in this single statement, all of the major questions that philosophers have been asking for the last 6,000 years are answered or are addressed. The when, the how, the who, and the what. The when, in the beginning. Which implies that before this beginning, there was the one who is mentioned next, Elohim, God. And the term that is used here for God is a grandiose term. It's Elohim. It's in the plural. It's some people, some scholars believe it's a plural of majesty. Others believe it may actually refer to the triune Godhead in some way. Others, uh, of course, Jews don't believe that. But I remember having a conversation with a Jewish friend of mine many, many years ago in Jerusalem. I'd met him for the first time. He had been a convert to Adventism from Judaism. And he said to me, where in the in the Bible, do you find the triune Godhead? Where do you find it first? So I mentioned Isaiah. No, before that. I mentioned a few other passages. Finally, I thought, okay, Genesis 1.27, let us make man in our image. No, before that. Well, how far back can you go before that? So I just looked at him blankly, and he said, Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. Now, he wasn't a scholar, but he knew something about the text. In the beginning, God created, and that word create, by the way, oh, hmm. D yesterday said a few things that, was quite interest, that were quite interesting last night. There's a special word used there. It's bara in Hebrew. It's only and always and consistently and exclusively used with God as its subject, because only God can bara something into existence. We use the word create very loosely today. I can create havoc, I can create a painting, I can create whatever, but in the Bible, the word bara, which is translated to create, is only and exclusively used with God as the subject. And so yesterday, you know, when Dee was saying, uh, asking my former student, Will Guthrie, uh, you know, what, what can you do can you, with, with, with the heart, right? Can you, can you, what, 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 what can you do with the heart? Is that something that you can change or is that something that a surgeon has to come in and change for you if you need some heart bypass surgery or something like that, right? And what is the answer? You can't do it yourself normally, right? Even if you're a surgeon, you usually can't do it yourself, I would guess. Now, what does David say in Psalm chapter 51 after his sin with Bathsheba? Create in me a new heart, O Lord. What verb does he use there? He uses the verb bara because he knows this is something he cannot do himself. He knows that he is a sinner and that without God working in his life, it is impossible. And so he uses a very specific term and he says, bara in me a clean heart, O oh God. If you don't know Hebrew, you won't catch that. That's what he says. Sorry, I'm spending way too much time on one slide here. The how created, yes. And the what? The heavens and the earth. That's a comprehensive, comprehensive thing that's being spoken of here. Yes, we'll go into more detail in the rest of the chapter, and in chapter two, we'll go even more in detail but the fact of the matter is, that's a comprehensive thing. So Genesis 1 
and two, and three, I would say, I would include three there. Actually, we usually refer to the entire pericope as Genesis 1 through 11. But all of that is foundational to everything else. It deals with the nature of God, the triune Godhead, the loving God who is relational, the institution of marriage, some of the things that we're going to talk about here. The covenant, by the way, that we have talked about and that we recently studied again in our Sabbath school quarterly. Um, all of those things. So let's start with biblical authority and unity. Biblical authority and unity. With the presuppositions of the Enlightenment and the historical critical method came the impetus for the emerging evolutionary hypothesis, which did not only have an effect in science, it had an effect in biblical hermeneutics, a profound effect. Accommodations for the evolutionary hypothesis in biblical studies became increasingly common in the early 20th century and even before that time. The first individual that we can document that caused a major shift in the interpretation of the account of Genesis 1 through 3 was a scholar by the name of Hamon Gunkel, a German scholar, of course. Um, you have to understand that prior to World War II, the center of science and theology was in Germany. The Lutheran church uh, was very, very strong. Gunkel came out of that tradition. And Gunkel redefined creation as a legend, as mythology. And he said, and I'm quoting him here, he said that He articulated that many things, quote, many things reported in Genesis go directly against our better knowledge. What did he mean by that? What we think we know today based on science. That was the evolutionary, uh, naturalistic evolutionary interpretation of the scientific data, which would, in his mind, take precedent over the biblical text and over everything else. Of course, he started a trend. What he meant, of course, by that is very clear. Evolutionary theory should be taken as the authoritative norm over the Genesis account. Subsequently, different non-literal genres of interpretation suggested for Genesis include this list that you see here. This is just a smattering of a few examples from the history of literature written over Genesis. Hook called it cultic liturgy, Wenham, a hymn, Steck, a metaphorical narration, Thompson, a story. By the way, does a story have to be, liter uh, does a story have to be factual to be a story? No. And a story is, a uh, story is what you, uh, hires Leichenbach and Young, theology. Does theology have to be historical? No. You can hypothesize theology can be philosophy. It doesn't have to be biblically based at all. Gibson calls it a metaphor or parable. Collins calls it an analogy. We'll quote from Collins a little bit later. Liturgy or worship by Fletheim and others. What is very clear as you go through this list, what becomes very clear as you go through this list is that it raises some serious questions concerning the modern trajectory of form critical genre studies. Number one, there appears to be no major scholarly consensus on the literary genre of the creation account in Genesis. Otherwise, why would you have this list? What is it then? Which of those is it? Interesting, okay. Secondly, form critical approaches that reassign the text to a different genre than history still allow the grammatical, some still allow the grammatical interpretation of days in Genesis 1 as literal. Interesting. Let's look at a couple of examples. James Barr, who probably could be thought of as the leading Hebrew scholar in the 20th century, a British scholar, taught at Oxford University, 
after his retirement, came here to Tennessee and taught at Vanderbilt. And uh, James Barr wrote this. He was a great critic of fundamentalism, by the way, and uh, Bible-believing Christians. He wrote this, in fact, the only natural exegesis is a literal one in the sense that this is what the author meant. But you have to understand that he can say this, but not necessarily agree with what the author meant. And it was the uh, Harvard dean of the Divinity School at Harvard uh, that came up with this great dichotomy between what it meant and what it means. So just because the text meant something at that time doesn't mean that it means the same thing in our time. And it's the job of the theologian to interpret what the text meant and put it into a context that uh, accommodates for the culture and other things today to uh, accommodate what it means. That was uh, Christar Stendhal, a very well-known uh, Scandinavian scholar. Gerhard von Rath, the leading Old Testament scholar of the 20th century in Germany, teaching at the oldest university there, Heidelberg University, said in his uh, multi-volume commentary on Genesis, page 47, the seven days of the creation week, I put that in there just so you know the context, that's what he's writing about, are unquestionably to be understood as actual days. He went on to say on page 65, what is said here is intended to hold true entirely and exactly as it stands. Everything that is said here is to be accepted exactly as it is written. Nothing is to be interpreted symbolically or metaphorically. You see, these scholars knew Hebrew. And they understood that the Hebrew, the writer of Genesis 1, could not have been more precise in his use of language in order to communicate a very clear message for generations to come. If a sequential period of seven literal and consecutive 24-hour days is what these scholars accepted as the lexicography, grammar, syntax, terminology, and time boundaries of evening and morning demand, then a non-literal view of the creation account raises serious implications for the authority of Scripture as the inspired Word of God. In other words, if this is what the writer is clearly trying to indicate, and we don't have time today to go into all this, I can give you a very detailed article, several of them, going through all of these uh, uh, arguments from the lexicography, grammar, and syntax. Uh, but at any rate, if, if that is what the author meant, and we're going to reinterpret what he meant as something different, then we have a problem as Bible-believing Christians as to uh, the creation account. Now, for these other scholars, it doesn't matter quite as much because they're making precedent the modern historical scientific context. Moses may have thought that's what it was like, but we know better today. That's what Gunkel said, right, a few moments ago. But Moses not only says it there, he says it in other books of the Pentateuch. He's consistently reaffirming a literal seventh-day sequence in, of creation in Exodus. This includes the manna falling in six days, but not on the Sabbath. By the way, that comes in Exodus 16, right? Long before Exodus 20, when the Ten Commandments are given. The fourth commandment where God created in six days and rested on the seventh as an example for all creation. And three, affirming the Sabbath as a sign in Exodus 31, for in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and on the seventh day he abstained from work and rested. I go into a lot more detail in my commentary on Exodus in the new Andrews uh, Bible commentary that just came out a year ago. Acts chapter 17, this is when Paul is on the Mars Hill in Athens and is testifying before the thought leaders and philosophers of his day. And he says, God who made the world and everything in it, since he is the Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshiped with man's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth. We need to hear that a little bit more often today. 
and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being as also some of your own, sorry, as some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Bold of Paul, isn't it? to declare the creator in the place where there were so many statues, including a statue of the unknown God. Matthew chapter 19, we'll talk about this a little bit later again, but Jesus reaffirms when he is asked a question about divorce in Matthew chapter 19, he says, have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? Jesus in all Let me emphasize this. Jesus and every single one of the New Testament writers refer to Genesis 1 through 11 as reliable history. You can have this article later to see all the references. So what would happen to these statements if God did not create in six days? What would happen to Paul's statement, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction, in righteousness. So we're going to go through one by one what would happen, the character and nature of God. On the sixth day, sorry, um, let me just turn there real quick. Many modern scholars, major Old Testament scholars, affirm, as we said already, that the writer of the Genesis meant the creation account to be taken literally. We've just gone over that. Um, We also have gone over the fact that Jesus affirmed the entirety, uh, affirmed the creation account in Matthew chapter 19. But the relationship between creation and the incarnation of Christ is revealed again in the parallel between Genesis 1-1 and John chapter 1 verses 1 through 4. There we read, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things, how many things? All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. This particular text here reaffirms very clearly that in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God, that all things were made through him. Christ spoke matter into existence in the beginning. He was the agent of creation. We see this in Colossians 1, 15 through 16, Hebrew 1, 1 through 2. God spoke, Christ spoke matter into existence at the beginning as the Spirit of God was moving over the face of the waters in Genesis 1 2. Psalm 33 9 reaffirms, For he spoke and it came to be, he commanded and it stood firm. For by faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command, so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. That is Hebrews 11 3. When God says, Let us make man in our image, the triune Godhead is found implicitly in Genesis 1 as powerfully working to create an ecosystem for life and to fill that ecosystem with perfect harmony, breathtaking beauty, and diversity. God repeatedly declares it to be good and finally that it is very good. So if God did this not in those literal days but started the process billions of years ago by simply forming matter and allowing it to evolve through some form of theistic evolution or progressive creationism or something like that, what impact would that mean, would it have for the nature of God? How would we need to interpret the character of God, reinterpret the character of God? First of all, I would say that the truth about God would be distorted. He would be robbed of his power. He would be robbed of his power to speak fully formed elements and creatures into existence, as the Latin term would say, ex nihilo. 
This has implication also for Christ's power. Norman Gully, a very dear friend of mine who unfortunately just passed away last week at the age of 88. A longtime professor here at Southern Adventist University, a masterful systematic theologian who has written our only systematic theology four massive volumes. Published by Andrews University Press. Um, very sad, his memorial service will be um, on the 30th next, next Sabbath uh, at the College Dale Church. But Norman, a good, good, dear friend of mine, said this long ago. To accept his creative power during his life on earth necessitates accepting his creative power in the Genesis record. For both are equally supernatural and both are given to us through divine inspiration. So what would it have for Christ's power to change the water into wine? Or the paralyzed man at Bethesda when he says, raise up and take up your bed and walk in John chapter 5. Or Jairus' daughter, little girl, I say to you, arise. Or to Lazarus, Lazarus, come forth. Would he have that power? And if he didn't have it at the beginning, what makes us think he would have it then? Second of all, we have an impact on the character of God that is the very character of God himself and Christ himself. You see, it would mean that God created matter in the beginning but allowed animals and humans to compete through millions of years of torture and death in the Holocaust of the survival of the fittest. How is this congruent with the God who warned Adam of the evil of sin and the evil of death? How would this be congruent with a God who notices when a sparrow falls? Or the one who came to give life. The idea that life originates from death is a pagan idea. It is an idea that is not biblical. It is an idea that is steeped in the mythical worldview of all other world religions except the biblical historical view that we have in scripture and that the major monotheistic religions have in their traditions. Every other religion differs from that in this regard. I'll just give you a couple of examples that are, as an archeologist, the Atrahasis epic, one of the oldest Akkadian accounts of the creation and the flood. In the Atrahasis epic, man is created from the flesh and blood of a slaughtered God mixed together with clay. Oh yes, scholars say, you see, there is clay involved, therefore there's something, ah, the biblical writers borrow this from the ancients. No, there's nothing about the slaughtering of God in the Genesis account, I'm sorry, or violence that was required for the creation of things, that's, that's non-existent there. In fact, we can say that there's a bit of a polemic in the creation account vis-a-vis -vis all these other ancient accounts that are out there. That's an article I wrote in that other volume I mentioned. So what do we have going on here? The cycle of death and rebirth is so intrinsic in the mythical worldview. I mean, you can see it in, Egypt, in Egyptian, in the Egyptian worldview. This is the Ouroboro, the, the, the serpent eating its own tail. This is the cycle of life and death. And by the way, um, that is steeped in all of the media that we are seeing for the last 20 or 30 years. It's everywhere. Um, watch what you, be careful what you watch out there. It's not just entertainment, it's, it's an ideology that is being promoted and being uh, sent to, to everyone. Um, here we have, here we have uh, this is out of King Tut's tomb, by the way, King Tutankhamun's tomb, and this is this idea, this cyclical idea of life. Um, you remember, what was it? Was it the Lion King and the cycle of life? A circle of life, excuse me, the circle of life. It's, this, is, this is the world view, and it's in African religion, it's in Asian religions, it's all throughout history, and it comes all the way back from the beginning. You will surely not die. So, here's an Egyptian scene. What's interesting about this, you see a bunch of stars, you see a couple of serpents here. 
I wouldn't be comfortable with any of those uh, humans depicted or gods depicted there. The other day I was taking a walk, this was just a couple of weeks ago on Sabbath here at the VW Park, not very far away, and I was uh, being a friendly guy, greeting the person that was coming down opposite of me as we were on our walk. Our Sabbath after was a long hike, and as they, that, that family was coming towards me, I said hello, and as I turned my head and my peripheral vision, I noticed something that I was about to step on. It was a serpent, and it wasn't a good one. What's the one they have here? It was a copper head. And I jumped. I only have one thing in common with Indiana Jones, by the way. That is, I hate snakes. So, <laughs> so I jumped. I jumped. And my friend who was with me, a very good friend of mine who's a physician here in this community, is a radiologist. He had a pair of these. Have you seen these walking sticks before? They look like ski, you know, ski poles, but they're actually walking sticks. He had a couple of those, and he didn't hesitate. And he grabbed those sticks, and he went, he used it like a baseball bat. He went, boom! And that copperhead went flying off of the, he was just sunning himself there, the poor guy, you know. He went flying off into the bush. The two sticks that my friend had broke, Felt really bad, you know, but he saved my life. I was, I was thankful for that, right? So anyway, and uh, he finished the job later with the broken sticks, by the way. And uh, all the ladies were saying, what are you doing? Anyway, so what is happening in this scene? You can't read the Egyptian hieroglyphics, so let me help you understand what's happening. This is a, this is a scene of the Amduat in the, uh, in the tomb of Tutmosis III, who might be the pharaoh of the Exodus. It says uh, here, this is from uh, Eric Hornung, one of the leading Egyptologists, his book, Conceptions of God in the Ancient Egypt. Against a background of stars, you saw the stars there, right? Stands a winged snake with two pairs of legs. The caption tells us, Death, the great God, who made God and men. Are you, are you, are you with me? In other words, if you have a cycle of life and death, pretty soon you get things mixed up, and death produces life. And then life, death, death, life, death, life. You know, it's, that's what it is, right? So that's what is it. Death, the great God. That is Atum, by the way. Atum is holding the wings of the serpent. He's the creator god, one of the creator gods in ancient Egypt. And um, anyway, we can't go into a lot of detail here. But notice what uh, Professor Hornung, the Swiss uh, Egyptologist, says, a personification of death as a creator god and an impressive visual realization of the idea that death is a necessary feature of the world of creation that is of the existence in general. In other words, there is no time in which death was not present. Death is part and will always be part of the cycle of life. And that is what most world religions believe. And we have to be careful because the Bible does not teach that. The Bible teaches something very, very different. So God who creates animals and humanity in a perfect world, what does he do? He blesses them. Third, a God who intricately performs the miracle of life so that it can be studied in nature and through the complexity of the cell or the tiny seed that produces a tree or a bird caring for and feeding her chicks inspires the desire to worship and invokes the innate sense of moral accountability in humanity. That's why Paul, when he spoke to the Athenians, we just quoted this a moment ago, said, God who made the world and everything in it now commands all men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day in which he will judge all the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. In Romans 1.20, people are without excuse having witnessed the wonders of creation. A non-literal view of the Genesis account removes this accountability because nature as we know it today would have evolved over millions of years without much or any divine design or providence. Within the theistic evolutionary system, the complexity of living things no longer leaves unbelievers without excuse. Naturalistic evolution has a major impact on moral issues in society, such as euthanasia, animal and human rights, purpose, 
and the divine origin of ethics. I'm referring here to a book some years ago published by Oxford University Press by James Rachels, Created from Animals, The Moral Implications of Darwinism. And uh, this is a dissertation. By the way, there's a dissertation written about this by my colleague, Dr. Stephen Bauer, um, who, who did a masterful job of looking at all of this. So we have a very, very, we have a big problem with the character of God if we delve into some of these alternative interpretations. We go next to the origin of nature and Adam and Eve. Oh, I gotta hurry. Well, let me summarize. There is a triple emphasis on the creation of humanity in Genesis 1, 27 through 29 or so. Triple emphasis. Remember we talked about the word bara? What does the Bible say? Well, let me just turn to it real quick and read it to you. We, we know it pretty well, but it's good to read it in the text. Bara is used here three times in Genesis chapter 1 beginning in verse 26 actually, but now let's go to 27, it's 27, I was right, 27. And God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. How many times was created used? Three times. You know, we have a saying there, Hebrew is an interesting language. In Hebrew, uh, there are no exclamation marks. There, there's no, um, there are no punctuation marks at all in Hebrew, really. Um, they were all added later on by the Masoretes um, in the Middle Ages. So we don't have any, any punctuation marks in Hebrew at all. We don't have any periods. We don't have any exclamation marks. We don't have question marks. Everything is done a little bit differently in Hebrew. But the way you emphasize, and we don't have bold, you know, we don't have italics, the way we emphasize things when we write things, right, in our modern day. How do they emphasize, how did they emphasize something? By repetition. And if you, if you, if you repeat something twice, which often we find in the Psalms, you know, we find these repetitions, that's, that's important. If you repeat something three times, that's like the paramount of, Emphasis. That's like the most emphasis you can give on anything in Hebrew is to repeat something three times. And by the way, it doesn't only occur here. It also occurs in Genesis chapter 5. Let's turn there real quick. Genesis chapter 5 while we're there. Oh, don't want to leave out the Bible when we're talking about the Bible, right? Genesis chapter 5. It says, this is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day when God created man, he made him in the likeness of God, he created them, male and female, and he blessed them and named them man in the day when they were created. You got that? Three times again. By the way, some people don't take Genesis 5 literally. They say, ah, oh, these, these genealogies, you know, we don't have to take those literally, Genesis 5 and 11. That has everything to do with how old the age of the earth is, by the way. Okay, that's another topic. Let's move on. But notice it's there again. By the way, we allow the Bible to interpret the Bible, right? Scripture interprets Scripture, and when we find it in several places, it's even more importantly emphasized. So here we have these references, these reinforcements. Other biblical writers trace the origin of all human beings back to the first two humans, Adam and Eve, the amplification of the creative means in Genesis 2 conveys the personal attention given to this intimate act by God. By the way, Genesis 2 just is a zooming in of what happened in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 29. It expands. God is now the personal Yahweh Elohim who stoops down and forms man out of the dust of the ground and then breathes into him the breath of life. What an intimate picture of God. Some of you may have done CPR before. It's a pretty, pretty intimate thing maybe, right? God is doing something here intimately and I wonder how God felt and I wonder how Adam felt when Adam opened his eyes for the first time. I remember when my daughter Daniela was born and that happened to me. They placed her after they had cleaned her up and wrapped her up in a very nice warm 
flannel thing. They put her on this table and the nurse calls me over. I was in awe of the whole thing. I had never experienced anything like this in my life, you know. And I come over and I am standing over her there and she knew exactly what she was doing. I had no idea what was going to happen next. But they had a warming light on over Daniela, this little tiny creature who was not crying at all, just quietly there. And then she turned the warming light off while she told me where to stand. And then she said, look down. Then she turned the warming light off. And Daniela opened her eyes for the first time and stared up into mine. Wow. You, you can't describe the feelings that go through a father at that moment in time. Terror. <laughs> Terror. Um, love, the most unbelievable love that you can ever, ever think to experience uh, for a, 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 a part of you that didn't even exist until a few months earlier. I mean, it was just, just such an incredible thing. And, and then just this awe of what it meant to create something, to recreate something. What a beautiful thing God has given us to be able to be involved in just a fraction of what his experience is with our own children and with our own families. God's special creation of Eve is marked by his divine reflection. It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him and he built different terminology used here bana the woman from the rib of the man and thought brought her to him they were instructed to be fruitful and multiply to fill the earth and subdue it to have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air over every living thing that moves on the earth humans were created to care for god's creation and to fill it, that creation with life abundantly So what happens? What happens when we reject this bara terminology? What happens when we adjust the timelines of Genesis chapters one through three? What happens when all of this happens? Well, let me cite some of the leading scholars of the world today who consider themselves creationists, but who have a very different view of the timing of creation. Francis Collins should be familiar to all of us. He just retired from being director of the National Institutes of Health. He's Dr. Fauci's boss, was Dr. Fauci's boss. He's also a creationist. Uh, we should say a theistic creationist. He has published a number of books. One of his recent books published in 2006, The Language of God, A Scientist Presents Evidence for Belief. By the way, Dr. Collins was also responsible for the Genome Project. So that makes him very well known. So this is what he writes as an expert on genetics. Population geneticists conclude that, and I didn't quote the whole thing, our species descended from a common set of founders, approximately 10,000 in number, who lived about 100 to 150,000 years ago. Hmm, okay. So, Dennis Alexander, another scholar, writes, the founder population that was the ancestor to all modern humans was only 9,000 to 12,000 respectively active people. 9,000 to 12,000. Oh, I'm sorry, not respectively, reproductively active people. Excuse me, I misquoted him. In other words, the gene pool for our first ancestors was not one man and one woman. This means that Adam and Eve were not really created by God, but were born from human parents, if they were in existence at all. This is in direct conflict with Genesis 2, which states that God directly formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And that God built Eve from that rib that we just spoke about. Luke affirms this in the genealogies when he writes, Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. Did you ever read that little passage? That little verse in Luke, in the genealogy of Luke? Seth, the son of Adam, the son of 
God, not the son of nine to, to 12,000 ancestors. Paul states explicitly that Adam had no parent when he writes the first man, Adam, in 1 Corinthians 15.45. But if Adam had a human father, then he would not be the first man. And likewise, how could Genesis 3.20 refer to Eve as the mother of all living when there had been thousands of others living before her? Second, the order and sequence of creation which Adam has created first and then later Eve to fully complement the first human parents would no longer be necessary. Here I'm going to be quoting frequently from a very well-known Anglican scholar who may be familiar to some of you, N.T. Wright, former Bishop of Durham and has written enormous amounts of material. N.T. Wright suggests that God chose one pair from the rest of early hominids for a special, strange, demanding vocation. This pair, call them Adam and Eve if you like, were to be representatives of the whole human race. Another well-known Old Testament scholar at Wheaton College, John Walton, states and suggests that Adam and Eve should be understood as archetypes representing every man. He uses the E, capitalized every man, who embodies all others in the group. Walton states that the Bible, quote, makes no claims regarding biological human origins for Genesis, quote, talks about the nature of all people, not the unique material origins of Adam and Eve. I recently attended, this was a few years ago now, attended a symposium at the Evangelical Theological Society of which I'm a member. By the way, evangelicals that are part of that society, and these are all evangelical theologians, have to sign a declaration that affirms their belief in the infallibility of Scripture. Okay? So, here, here they were. Big panel discussion, five scholars. The debate, the issue, were Adam and Eve actual human beings at the beginning of creation or not. Three of that panel, was it four? I can't remember now, but at the majority of the panel said not. These are leading evangelical scholars. Dennis Lemereau, writing in a very well-known Press in Grand Rapids, Michigan, Zondervan, very well-known press, taking the position of no historical Adam, says, Adam never existed in Holy Scripture, makes statements about how God created living organisms that in fact never happened since real history in the Bible begins roughly around Genesis 12 with Abraham. So the rejection completely of Genesis 1 through 11. So what happens then with these explanations if they are the explanations that we uh, see here. What takes place here with these explanations? Do they correspond to what Genesis actually says concerning the material creation and origin of Adam and Eve? The order of creation, as Paul reaffirms when he writes, for Adam was formed first, then Eve, 1 Timothy 2.13, or what Jesus explicitly states in his confirmation, of this special creation. Jesus remarks most succinctly, we already quoted this verse, that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female. Or was there something else that was made before they became male and female eventually? So to reinterpret Genesis requires scholars to reinterpret Paul and Jesus, and this is what many are doing. Peter ends is another example, but I won't have time to go into that. Let's go next to the origin of the Sabbath. Well, I don't have to spend a lot of time with this. I think most of you know where we are on this. Let's first of all look at what the Bible says. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and he did what? Rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Before we go to Revelation chapter 14, I want to go to Revelation chapter 3 with you. I find it fascinating. I just got back from Turkey leading a tour with the Hope Channel with Dr. Derek Morris, my former colleague here at Southern, who's now the president of Hope Channel. 
his wife Bordell, and um, we traveled through the seven churches of Revelation. So I'd like to take you to the last of those seven churches. You know which church that is, right? Laodicea. So turn with me to Revelation. Oh, why am I in Philippi Philippians? Sorry. Revelation chapter what? Three. Thank you. In Revelation chapter 3, it's very interesting. You go through these seven churches and you go through each of the seven churches. These letters are addressed by whom? Who's writing these letters? Well, yes, John is, but who is actually writing the letters? Who is inspiring John to write the letters? Christ is. And Christ's titles that are being used in the first verses of each of these letters to the seven churches are reflections on what he saw and describes and often repeated from Revelation chapter 1, except with a few exceptions, and here is one of those exceptions. Notice what it says here. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, we're in verse 14 of chapter 3, the amen, the faithful and true witness. By the way, is yours in red there? No, it shouldn't be in red because it's not. Well, yeah, it is in red because Jesus is speaking, right? The amen, the faithful, and the true witness. Do we have a problem with truth today? Yes. Do you think God knew that we would have a problem with truth today? Yes. Isn't it interesting that he calls Jesus the true and faithful witness in a world in which truth is relative and your truth is your truth and my truth is my truth? And look at the next sentence or the next phrase here. The beginning of the creation of God. That's the title of Christ. The beginning of the creation of God. Do you think God would have known that after 1844 there would be a problem with the issue of creation in our world today? Before Darwin and his Origin of the Species was published, which was largely finished in 1844, by the way. There was another scholar by the name of Robert Chambers who published a book entitled The Vestiges of the Natural Creation. And he was more influential than Darwin. Abraham Lincoln had that book in his bookshelf. And it was a huge controversy at the time, promoting the ideas that Darwin was too afraid to publish during his life. It came out later. Um, the Origin of the Species, but it was, it was huge. It, it was published in 1844, very interesting. So here we have Revelation 14, 7. What does it say, the first angel's message? Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, and the springs of living water. It's there on the screen. What is that in reference to? Seven. Creation, and yes, it is almost a direct quote out of the fourth commandment, which is the Sabbath commandment. So here we have it. Do you think that's a coincidence that the first angel's message and the messages that we're to proclaim at this time in Earth's history begins with an affirmation of Christ as the creator of all things? Should that, I mean, this is amazing to me. This is wonderful. God knew what we would be going through right now. God knew the controversy that we would be facing and how fundamental it would be for everything that we hold dear and everything that he has been trying to teach us through his word. By the way, it's very interesting. Ellen White has this uh, chapter, chapter 9 in Patriarchs and Prophets entitled The Literal Week. And this is the first, first uh, sentences of that, that particular chapter. Like the Sabbath, the week originated at creation and it has been preserved and brought down to us through Bible history. God himself measured off the first week as a sample for successive weeks to the close of time. Like every other, it consisted of seven, what? Literal. Literal days. Six days were employed in the work of creation. Upon the seventh, God rested and he blessed it and set it apart as the day of rest for man. Literal days. And we have a problem today voting a statement on the authority of Scripture because the word literal is in there. Interesting. By the way, I didn't include this, but what does a disregard for a literal creation do to our belief in the spirit of prophecy? Isn't that a fundamental belief of our church as well? 
My father, years ago, was privileged and honored to write the seminal article on the Sabbath in the, probably at the time, and still today, one of the most quoted Bible dictionaries in the world, the Anchor Bible Dictionary, a six-volume dictionary. And uh, this is what he wrote, published in 1992. With the dismissal of creation as the origin for the Sabbath, Scholars have searched for Sabbath origins outside of Israel, assuming that it was borrowed from some other ancient civilization, be it Babylonian, Kenite, Arabic, Ugaritic, or sociological. In spite of the, intensive, the extensive efforts of more than a century of study into extra-Israelite Sabbath origins, it is still shrouded in mystery. There's, in other words, no consensus in the scholarly world. No hypothesis commands the respect of a scholarly consensus. Still, Historical critical scholars would not attribute the Sabbath to a divine origin, but rather would limit it to a human invention, which would have some major implications for the Sabbath authority. Let's go back to N.T. Wright. This is a quote from a recent book, well, 2011, fairly recent. Scripture and the authority of God. Interesting, the word authority is in there. But notice what Wright does with the Sabbath, because he does, he's a theistic evolutionist. Linear time, which was part of God's creation, this is not my, this is what, this is his writing, okay? Linear time, which was part of God's creation, continues, but it is now intersected with a new phenomenon, a new kind of time. So time seems now capable of being telescoped together and then pulled apart again. One might call this spirit time. All of this is focused on Jesus Christ. He goes on to write in that book, Now that heaven and earth have come together in Jesus Christ, and now that the new day has dawned, we live, from that point of view, in a perpetual Sabbath. So for N.T. Wright, does it matter what day we really worship on? No, because it is a perpetual, it, we are living in this eschatological period of time where Sabbath is, it's everything, it's every day. Fascinating, isn't it? Oh, I don't have time for this, but I need to. I'm going to have to stop before I'm over with this presentation. I'm sorry. I got too excited about this. Apologize. It's interesting that on the sixth day of creation, God comes to the climax of his creation, right? Humanity. In other words, all of this was created for us. And uh, as he comes to that climax, it is fascinating that that plural is used, right? Let us make man in our image. We've talked about this already. But isn't it also interesting that today, marriage is in crisis. There's no question in anyone's mind that no matter where you turn, the family is under attack. And that shouldn't surprise us. Because if marriage is an institution of creation, which it is absolutely just as the Sabbath is, wouldn't that be an object of Satan's great fury today? Satan would like nothing more than to destroy the family. Remember, he was not allowed to create when Jesus was, and remember that he was not allowed to procreate either. So in our society today, it's attacked in all fronts. This picture, by the way, uh, taken in Alaska, that's uh, my former student, Dr. Timothy Matthews. He's an avid photographer does all kinds of, he's won all kinds of awards with GoPro. He just moved to Montana, so I don't know how much we're going to see from Alaska anymore, but he gave me permission to use this. And, and I, what I like about this picture and what I don't like about this picture is they're going to get hit from both sides, aren't they? <laughs> and uh, that's what's happening today in our society. We're getting hit from all sides on the issue of marriage, on all fronts. Many of the world's nations have approved same-sex marriage. Previous laws that have protected the family have been abolished. And there's, this is an unprecedented development in, in many respects. So let's look at the creation institution. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. We've read all of this already. We've read Genesis 2. No, we didn't read Genesis 2. A man shall leave his father and his what? Mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become what one flesh then God 
We're skipping back, going back to Genesis 1. God blessed them and said to them, but this goes together with the one flesh thing. God blessed them and God said to them what? Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. By the way, why is this a foundation for everything else? It's God's design, of course, but why is it foundational? Think about this for a moment. The Bible chase, traces God's generations through history, through that marriage bond as humanity, and through the generations creates, recreates, continues that process. The promised seed of the Messiah would not be possible without marriage and without that institution. Abraham and Sarah are promised a great nation and it would not have been possible to be fulfilled in a different way in, in, than which God designed. Jesus and Paul in the New Testament says, Jesus says, therefore what God has joined together, let not man separate. Romans 1 says they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worship and serve the creature rather than the creator. This choice to believe in a lie led them to their practice. This is the next verse. For this reason, God gave them up to their vile passions. And what follows, of course, is the description of same-sex behavior between both two females and between two males. So in the New Testament, notice how Jesus responds to these Pharisees. And Jesus reaffirms Scripture and Genesis in particular. Paul specifically addresses the foundational nature of Genesis in Romans chapter 1. And Paul goes on to state what we just read here a moment ago. And, and this is all important because for Paul, biblically defined sexuality between a man and a woman is natural. That's the term he uses through the, the, the uh, passage here. And it is the, re the refusal to accept the creator by exchanging his worship with that of the creature that causes them to be handed over to their passions or their lusts. So it's very interesting. We don't have time to go into all this. We know the discussion in the churches regarding all of this today, the gender issues, the major issues that are taking place in our world. Mainstream Protestant churches are increasingly accepting same-sex marriage. 2009, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America and the Episcopal Church USA both voted independently to approve homosexual clergy. Lutherans recently elected a practicing gay bishop in California, and the Presbyterian Church USA welcomes practicing homosexuals as ministers and leaders as of 2011. In Europe, the Scottish Episcopal Church approved same-sex marriage unions in 2017. And so you can see that this trend is continuing. Right now, the Methodist Church is being split over this major issue in major ways. And we had one of their leading scholars on our campus speaking about this issue uh, just recently on our campus. And he said, folks, you better take note because in our denomination, we're looking what happened to the Episcopalians because we know what's gonna be happening in ours. And he says, if you guys aren't careful, it's gonna happen with you as well. You need to take note, you need to take note. Old Testament scholar who wrote a book on this subject. So these issues involve what? They in involve a redefinition of creation and the acceptance of an evolutionary worldview in many cases, that's true. They can also involve a reinterpretation of key passages in scripture that have historically been seen as prohibiting homosexual behavior. And three, an application of passages on love and acceptance, or a emphasis, we should say, of passages on love and acceptance that take precedence over clearer passages on the subject. Now, by the way, this is a very, very important hermeneutical principle. I've been talking a little bit about hermeneutics here. Very important hermeneutical principle. You always allow clearer passages to have precedence over unclear passages not the other way around, okay? When the Bible speaks on something clearly, that is the passage that we should take to heart. But we find that that is not what is taking place in many cases. And I, I, I'm not going to go through all of this today, but this is a recent book. Let me just uh, share with you, sorry, let me just share with you this uh, here. 
Vine states, this is, this is relating now to the question of redefining passages based on culture. Okay, the Levitical enactments characterize it as ceremonial. This is John Boswell, Christianity, Social Tolerance, and Homosexuality, Chicago, University of Chicago Press. The Levitical enactments, which are very, very clear. We didn't go over them now, I skipped over them, but you can read them later on, right? Gen uh, Leviticus 16 and 20 are very clear. These Levitical enactments, he writes, characterize it as ceremonial, unclean, rather than inherently evil. So he kind of relegates these to, to Jewish kind of uh, Jewish things. And Vines, a very influential scholar, says, yes, ancient Israel was dominated by patriarchal structures and norms, which we see reflected throughout the Old Testament, including in its prohibitions of male same-sex intercourse. But far from being a reason to view scripture as outdated or sexist, the Bible itself is what points us toward a path where patriarchy is no more. Where does he go for that? Galatians 3.28. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Jesus Christ. This is the key text for those that are in the Christian community wanting to say, well, we need to understand this now through the trajectory that Jesus and Paul couldn't quite get to completely, but were pointing us towards in this trajectory hermeneutic for same-sex relations. But is this really what Paul is saying in the context of this passage? What is Paul really talking about? Does Galatians 3.28 redefine the image of God's creation order? Is Paul pointing us to a hermeneutic outside of Scripture itself that the church can move towards? And why would Paul contradict himself advocating a hermeneutic where his own clear passages in Romans 1, which we just saw, in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11, 1 Timothy 1, 8 through 10, in which those are no longer valid. So there are a lot of issues that are at stake here. In fact, this is not the hermeneutic Paul uses at all. Like Jesus in Matthew 19, Paul does the opposite. He unequivocally uses scripture by citing the creative work of God in Genesis repeatedly in his writings as he talks about these issues. And this becomes the basis for his theology of marriage and the roles of men and women and the gender issue that we are kind of dealing with sometimes today as well. So he does this without asking whether they are engaging in a, mono a mon monogamous or a loving relationship. The question is irrelevant because for Paul, the prohibitions in Leviticus that include homosexual acts are taken at face value and normative. If you want to read more about this, Roy Gain has written an excellent article on this in a book published by the seminary some years ago on homosexuality, marriage, and the church. So when we talk about identity, and I know we have a parallel seminar going on on some of these issues as well by my good friend Ron Woolsey, but I, I would say this, for Jesus, Paul, and other writers of the New Testament, it is the believer's identity in Christ and our need for the grace of Christ that provides the solutions to the temptations and tendencies of sin. Jesus said, these things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Just as in Adam all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, so in Christ and through his grace and righteousness all can overcome so that we might put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. The honor of the Christian is to identify ourselves in Christ, to submit ourselves to his created identity for us and to define and redefine ourselves constantly and consistently with scripture so that we can fulfill the three angels' messages to call a people out of confusion into the wondrous light of Christ. That's not always an easy thing to do. And I know that there are major issues that we wrestle with but if we love people, we will want to draw them to Christ. 
the origin of sin and death. Well, I'm just going to shortly paraphrase this very quickly. We know from the ancient world, we already talked about the ancient world, right? That this was a different view of the origin of death. But we also know that the world was created in perfect order. As indicated by the declaration of God six times during the creation narrative that what he created was what? Tov, good. And the seventh time God saw all that he made and it was very good. In Hebrew, tov meod. The New Testament affirms the origin of death just as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin and thus death spread to all men. Death reigned from Adam to Moses. I'm jumping around a little bit here in Romans 5. Death reigned from Adam to Moses even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam who is a type of him who was to come. For if by the one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in the life through the one Jesus Christ. Norm Gully again says, It was Adam and not his creator who brought death to the planet. It was Christ who came to die to put death to death and liberate the fallen race. It was the act of the first Adam that caused the death condemnation, and it was the act of the second Adam's death that provided salvation. Christ did not use death to create humans in Eden. He died to save humans at Calvary. Beautifully put. Romans 6.23 says, The wages of sin is death, but what? The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And actually, the major promise of all of Scripture is that death is an abnormal state, connected with human moral guilt and not connected with an evolutionary past. So, what do we do then with all of this? To remove death as the wages of sin strikes at the very heart of the gospel. For if death is not related to sin, then the wages of sin is not death and Christ would have no reason to die on the cross of Calvary for our sins. Think about that for a moment. This is a huge problem. There have been two major dissertations written over this issue of death before sin and its implications for theology. One in Germany, uh, a German dissertation written by an evangelical scholar and one at Andrews University. Then there's this book, I love the title, No Adam, No Gospel. Think about that. To remove a literal creation together with a literal Adam and Eve made in the image of God would remove our hope that we might someday be restored to the image of the one who died to pay the ultimate price for our sins. Righteousness by faith is removed and there is no gospel. So these are major implications. I mean, if you were to really think about this, you, what do you do with Christianity? What do you do with the whole concept? And I'm going to end. I wanted to leave time for questions. I want to end with the, new, the old and the new creation. And I wanted to look at this here. The advent of Christ is our cherished hope, isn't it? It's the cherished hope of every believer. It's my cherished hope that I'm going to see my friend Norm Gully very soon again. Amen. It's my cherished hope that I'll see my dad again. It's my cherished hope and our cherished hope that God who promises, Behold, I will create a new heavens and a new earth. And it shall remain before me that that promise will take place. The new heaven, the new earth will be a place of peace and life restored. For Isaiah 65 says, The wolf and the lamb shall feed together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The very terminology of heavens and earth, together with the same verb bara, now is an imperfect and future reality, harkens back to the very words used in Genesis 1 and 2. Isaiah's statements indicate that the new creation is intimately bound up with the first, one where no violence was present and where animals could live together in harmony without fear 
for there shall be no more curse, Revelation 22, verse 3. So how do we put this succinctly? What you believe as your protology will have a profound effect on your beliefs in eschatology. In lay people's terms, how you conceptualize the beginning origins will impact how you will conceptualize the future events of the end. They're inextricably bound together. So how would we talk about this? Well, the Bible, first of all, presents a very different view from the world around us. The world around us, we said, presents a view of what? A cycle, right? The circle of life. The Bible presents a linear view of history that has a purpose and a destination in mind. It is not something that simply keeps going and going, yes, we wake up in the morning, the sun is up, it goes down the evening. Yes, the ancients saw this too, and they created this cyclical world, but God goes beyond that, and he says, I have a bigger plan for you. God, who worked at the beginning, is working at the end. But what is interesting is, as you look at the theology of Protestant, Catholic, and other uh, denominations around those denominations around the world what becomes very clear very quickly is that those who have reinterpreted Genesis and lost sight of that very special creation at the beginning with time they have lost sight of that literal second coming of Jesus Christ it is true almost without exception and we can look at examples I'll look at a couple again but we can look at examples you see Jesus is affirmed as him who is from the beginning In revelation three times as the Alpha and the Omega twice as the beginning and the end and the first and the last Christ who set time in motion for human existence in the beginning will set a place in a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and God will do what? He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death nor sorrow nor crying. There shall be no more pain for the former things have passed away. So what do scholars do with the second coming? What do they do with these wonderful verses that we often read at funerals like 1 Thessalonians? Well, here's N.T. Wright again. Let's use him as, as an example. There are many others we could quote from as well. His book, Surprised by Hope, Rethinking Heaven, the Resurrection, and the Mission of the Church. Notice he's not only rethinking heaven, he's rethinking what? the resurrection. Why would he be rethinking that? Because if God is not all powerful to create life at the beginning, how could he be all powerful to resurrect at the resurrection? There's a lot of issues here, right? So what does he say? This is a quote from him, page 132 and 33. Thus when Paul speaks of the Lord descending in 1 Thessalonians. You remember that passage. It's a beautiful passage. He is finding richly metaphorical ways of alluding to three other stories that he is deliberately bringing together. The reality to which it refers is this, Jesus will be personally present. All right. How? <laughs> Not literally, that's not what N.T. Wright has in mind, but in our hearts, in our world. You see, they've spiritualized, they've, they have, yes, yeah, spiritualized the realities that are there. And this didn't start with N.T. Wright, this goes back to Rudolf Bultmann and some of the great theologians of the Lutheran tradition as well, very early on in the 20th century. Bultmann wrote a book entitled, um, uh, myth and reality where he had to reinterpret all of the New Testament promises of what heaven and what hell meant what 
what, what the devil meant, what Jesus meant, all of this had to be placed in a modernistic scientific plane in order to be acceptable in a modern world. And so what many theologians do, they use the same terminology that we use, but they import into it things that are not part of the definition of what historically has been understood. It's called theological doublespeak, by the way. All right, so we end with this. The resurrection of Christ is only part of the hope that we have. The other part of that hope goes all the way back to creation. Because just as Christ created by the word of his mouth, so he will create again or recreate us at the very end. You know, if you believe in progressive creation or theistic evolution, I mean, think about it for a moment. Is he going to take another 600,000 million years to, to, to allow humanity to develop again? Or will we all indeed be changed in the twinkling of an eye? That's the issue. Will it be an instantaneous thing like it was at the beginning or will it be something else? The Bible teaches something that is congruent with itself. And so we shouldn't be surprised today in our world that we live in. We shouldn't be surprised today that the emphasis in Christianity doesn't seem to be about the second coming anymore. It's about creating the kingdom of God here. It's about saving this planet. It's about going all through all of these steps for us to save even to some extent ourselves because this is all we have. So we need to be careful as we look through these various things, as we look through these various movements, we need to be th careful and think what is happening in our world around us? Where is it leading? Where is it going? And how can I remain faithful to Scripture? I want to close with this thought. I'm past my time by five minutes. I see my clock here on my computer. Let me simply say this. I'm a scientist and I'm a theologian. As a scientist, I have to look at all the data, evaluate all the data, and try to come up with ideas, hypotheses based on that data that is faithful to that data. And I want to do that faithfully. As a theologian, I want to look at the biblical text. I want to understand the biblical text. I want to be faithful to the biblical text, to all the data that the biblical text contains, and not argue away data that this text contains because it is somehow incongruent with something else that somebody else says. I have to be faithful to both sets. But ultimately, let me share this. This takes precedence. Amen. It has to. Amen. It's the word of God. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. I mean, how many times has science changed its idea about things? I mean, I've changed my idea about things. How many times have I changed my idea about things? But the word of God, it stands forever. So let us be faithful. Let us be faithful and let us not give up. By the way, let me end with this. I'm ending and ending and ending, but let me say this. Last thing, last thing, I promise. It is not a coincidence. It is not a coincidence that those passages that we looked at today in Revelation chapter 3 with Laodicea, in Revelation chapter 14 with the first angel's message, it is not a coincidence that they are there. And it is not a coincidence that the Seventh-day Adventist Church is almost the only worldwide movement church denomination today that affirms a literal six-day creation. It is not a coincidence. And if we lose that, we lose everything. We lose our eschatology, we lose our identity, we lose who we are. And we need to pray in that regard. Oh, thank you, Patty. I don't need to, but should I? I'm asking, I'm asking the conveners. I know that people want to go off for supper or something, but... All right, thank you. 
Let's end with a word of prayer and allow that to happen for those who you want to leave. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you are our creator God, that you are our redeemer God, and that you are a God who has promised that you will come again in the clouds of heaven. We thank you that we are Seventh-day Adventists. We are not simply Adventists. We are rooted in the Seventh-day Creation Week as we are rooted in the hope of the great second coming in Revelation. We accept the entire Bible for what it says and what it stands from, from Genesis 1-1 all the way down to the last verses of Scripture. And we thank you for this gift of Scripture that you've provided for each one of us to learn from, to learn about our Savior Jesus Christ, to emulate him, to become more like him, and to follow him wherever he leads. We thank you for being with us during this week. In Jesus' name, amen.